Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to Amanda for the introduction. Um, I'm Julia Leone, and I'll be talking about the butterfly component of our study today. Diane Larson will be presenting our vegetation component of our study, and Patrick Penarola will be presenting the bee component of our study, uh, just to give you a, a bit of a roadmap for moving ahead. Um, also not presenting with us today, but integral to the success of our project are Jen Larson at the University of Minnesota and Karen Oberhauser now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As the title of this talk suggests, our study aims to understand how grazing and fire management affect plants and pollinators in the tall grass prairie. Prescribed burns and cattle grazing are often used to manage our remaining prairie lands, as they mimic historic disturbance patterns that the prairie evolved with. However, with current fragmentation and habitat loss and degradation, it is important to understand how these management practices are affecting prairie plants and pollinators in the present day landscape. Because management can take years to become apparent, we have selected remnant prairies that have never been plowed and that have at least 10 years of documented management history. We chose 75 sites managed with either grazing or fire for vegetation surveys. Um, all within the Prairie Parkland province of Minnesota. Bees and butterflies were surveyed at a subset of 20 of these sites, 10 of which were burned and 10 grazed. Our sites ranged in size from roughly 1 to 140 hectares and included both DNR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, private, and Nature Conservancy lands. We are very thankful to all of our land owners and managers who so generously allowed us to survey their lands and provide management records and assistance. Um, it's been a great pleasure to work collaboratively with everyone over the past several years, and, and I hope some of you are listening today, so thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Diane for vegetation. Hi, this is Diane Larson, and um, I'm going to tell you briefly what our methods were like, and um, yeah, start from here. So we had 75 sites that we surveyed. And 20 of those were the insect sites, as Julie explained earlier. Um, each site was sampled once by us for vegetation, except for the insect sites, which we sampled in both 2016 and 2017. Um, to do the sampling, we determined the size of each prairie type, dry, wet, or music at each site, and sampled in proportion to their size. So the number of plots um, we did nested frequency plots on transects, and the number of plots were proportional to the size of the site and prairie type that we were sampling. We set the minimum at five plots and the maximum at 30. We also supplemented that with a botanist directed walk to improve our species capture rate. And you can learn more about this technique at our field day in June, and that will be advertised at the end of the talk. So what can we learn from vegetation? Um, first of all, I'm starting sort of at a high level and working down. Species richness, does one management type favor uh, more species than the other? Um, coefficient of conservatism, which you're probably all familiar with, but basically it's from zero, which is a weed, up to 10, which is a, a species that is only found in really high quality great prairies. So that's a, a, a sort of an artificial way of quantifying uh, conservatism. Uh, community composition, which is generally what kind of species do we have, what is, what is the co sort of the, um, the collective species on, on one management type, are they different from the collective species on a different management type, um, and does prairie type affect that. And finally, are some species particularly associated with each management type, and that's where we'll use an indicator species analysis to look at that. So starting with species richness, um, if one form of management favors a greater number of species, we expect consistently higher species accumulation curves for that management type. And what I'm showing you here is the data from 2016. On the left are the burn sites that had at least 15 plots, and on the right are the graze sites with at least 15 plots. And what this, what this, what you need to look at here is that the species, the number of species that we accumulate are, is on the y-axis and the number of plots on the x-axis on both of these. And these are just showing how species accumulated over the number of plots. So as you increase area, you expect more species. And so for the burn sites, we plateaued on the best sites at around 70 species. 
and at this this really terrible site, <laughs> which which um yeah Dibdal. I I feel bad for that site. It plateaued at more like less than ten species. So so that was a pretty big range, but most of the sites were um, were in that upper category. So looking over on the right at the gray sites. Um, the plateau came at a little bit lower level, more like 60 species, and at the highest, the best sites, but the lowest, the, the least good site in 2016 still had close to 40 species. Um, so there was less variation in the gray sites, but also uh, fewer species in the really good sites at, uh, that were grazed. In 2017, it's a little... Similar picture, but we didn't have a dib doll to bring down our, our averages in um, 2017. So the actually the burn sites turned out to be quite a bit superior to the gray sites, although none of this is really statistically significant. This is more of a picture to show you the range of species richness that we expect at these with the grazed and the burned. So um, generally a few more species in the burn sites than the grazed. Now, does mean conser conservatism of the species at a site vary between the burned and the grazed? So if one form of management results in more highly conservative species, the mean coefficient of conservatism should be higher for that management type. But if you take out those C equals zero, the weeds, the really icky species, um, and just want to look at what, you know, what the cons mean conservatism is for just the native species, um, that that would also tell us something about how invaded the, the um, management type sites might be. So to illustrate this, this is on the left-hand side, we have the mean coefficient of conservatism, which remember goes from zero for a weed to 10 for um, a really conservative species. Gray is burned and green is grazed in 2016 and 2017 on the x-axis. So you can see that burned sites tended to be a little bit, have a few more conservative species on average than the gray sites or mean conservative. Uh, neither of these are significantly different if you did statistics. 2017 is close, it was P equals 0.06. So if you then remove all those weedy species, 2016 we get very similar um, coefficients of conservatism, they both both grazed and burned go up considerably when you take out those mean, those, those uh, zero species. And in 2017, again, similar, um, but the grazed didn't come up quite as much as the burned. But again, none of these are significantly different. And if, in case you're wondering if um, prairie type made a difference, some people are concerned that wet prairies would suffer more from grazing, for example, from compaction and what have you. Um, so I separated them out, and these are just just a picture, basically, not statistically anything. It's just a picture to show you that the grazed, which are gray, and the burned, which are black, um, when you took all of the coefficients of conservatism, including the weeds, the burn sites um, were more conservative than the graze sites in general, and that didn't really differ a lot by by what kind of prairie you were in. And then when you take out the weeds, um, you really do still see a difference, in, at least especially in 2017, the burn sites were better still than um, in music and in wet than the graze sites. So that's just kind of giving you a little bit of a, a flavor of of what effect these um, prairie types might have. So um, if the two management types favor different plant communities, we would expect to see that the site separated based on this management type if we did an ordination. And so this is a non-metric multidimensional scaling ordination, and that's really just a fancy way of saying it's a picture, a snapshot of how similar these sites are to each other. So the green colored sites are grazed and the black are red, are, um, sorry, are um, burned. And what this shows you is basically I've drawn a line around the outside edge of, of the burned and the grazed sites. There's a huge amount of overlap. What this is saying is that the sites that are closer to each other on the figure are more similar to each other in their plant communities. And you can see that 
there's no, there's no big separation. So grazing and burning don't produce hugely different plant communities. This was from 2016, and basically the same thing from 2017. So, so we're not getting, um, you're not going to walk out into this prairie and say, oh my gosh, it's so different. So now if management affects plant communities differently in wet versus music prairies, we should expect to be able to see that in a, a canonical discriminant analysis. And what this does is try to, it actually is a way of trying to separate, see what species actually do separate these categories that we have talked about predetermined. So as uh, music and dry and, or sorry, music and wet and grazed and burned. So what this, this, uh, this is from 2016. What, these are just synthetic axes that, that were pulled out. So they're, they're really describing the best that this program can do to separate the categories that we um, specified. So you can see in 2016, music and wet are separated on the first, the canonical axis one. So you've got music on the left and wet prairies on the right. And that was 52% of the variance. So that was the big part of the variance. About half of the variance could be accounted for by the difference between grazed and burned, which you see grazed on the top and burned on the bottom. So what species really caused this? Well, for music sites, we're looking at um, Broman poa, which is not a good thing, and Budalua curtipendula. For wet sites, these are all natives, um, and you can see that they're pretty much wetland, wet, wet or continuum species. But the important thing, the burn sites, these are all native species that were dis distinguishing burn sites from graze sites. And the graze sites were more characterized by a number of exotic species as well as some native species. The reds are, are exotic species. So, so that really tells you that the gray sites are getting a little more pressure from exotics. And this, in 2017, it wasn't so clear cut. You can see that there's more of a, like the wet burned and music burned are not quite um, as different from the wet grazed and music grazed. So that's, that's telling you that we didn't have as good a separation, but the music sites, which were especially music burn sites, were characterized by by smooth brome and uh, violet pedatifida, which is a, a actually a good host plant for butterflies. The wet sites by um, a weedy species and not so. Burn sites were all, um, especially the wet burn sites, were uh, associated with native species and the music graze sites, um, lots of exotic species again. So finally, looking at the indicator species analysis, what this is doing is telling you which species have the highest fidelity to a particular group. Um, they look at the frequency of occurrence in a group and the lack of occurrence in, in the other group. So this is a very simple analysis, and what it says in 2016 is that the burned indicators are very similar to what we pulled out in the canonical discriminant analysis, except that Canada thistle turned up in there, and I bet it was a dip ball. Uh, sorry. <laughs> and the grazed indicators, again, we have a whole lot of invasive species that come in with the grazed sites. Um, in 2017, very similar results. Burned indicators are natives, and the grazed indicators, not so much native. And now I'm going to pass it off to Patrick for bees. Hi, folks. Um, so I've uh, spearheaded the bee efforts on this project, and I'm excited to be able to share some never-before-seen data with you here today. Uh, now, the questions that I'm really interested in exploring today, you're going to, it's kind of similar to what Julia is going to describe a little bit later, but um, does management type impact bee diversity? Do we really see any differences between um, burned and grazed prairies? Uh, and B, any differences we do see are those due to the management itself or, or due to the cascading effects from the vegetation community? Uh, now, to put that a little bit more formally, I'm putting forth that if burning and grazing have direct effects on bee abundance and species richness, then those measures will vary independently of the plant community. Now, I always like uh, to look at some things with pictures, so uh, let's break that down uh, briefly. Um, so suppose we have two prairies, uh, one managed with fire on the left uh, and one managed uh, with grazing on the right. 
Now, if these managements are directly impacting the species richness and abundance of bees, which I've uh, illustrated here with you know, different colored bees and different sizes, uh, then we expect uh, that the diversity, uh, the difference in bee diversity will persist even when accounting for how manage might, might, management might impact the plant community, which is represented here by uh, differently shaded grass. Um, now, to collect bees, I used uh, traps known colloquially as bee bowls. Uh, these are a pretty standardized tool, um, so I would set 30 of these small bowls out along a transect of about 180 meters, uh, then fill them up with soapy water. Uh, the idea is that a bee, often any other insect as well that's flying around a site, um, sees what looks to be a giant flower and swoops in to grab uh, some of that sweet nectar, um, but again, it's soapy water, so the surface tension is broken and the bee falls and, and drowns. Um, so these are left out for 24 hours, then collected. To try and survey our sites thoroughly, we divvied bowls up among prairie types, kind of um, the same ones that Diane just mentioned. Um, so these designations were based upon existing soil maps. And uh, regarding our bee bowls, if a survey was designated as 50% wet prairie, then 15 of our bowls went in on wet transects. And then, you know, if the remaining 40% was music and 10% dry, then there would be 12 and three bowls in each of those respective areas. Um, because this is a standardized method with very little observer bias, uh, we're using it as a means of collecting abundance data, and we did get quite abundant data. Um, now, unfortunately, not all bees are attracted to bulls equally, um, so we uh, accompanied that with a meandering walk. Um, so during this portion of the site visit, I would stalk around the prairie with my net at the ready, looking to collect bees on flowers. Uh, now, I only collected from flowers as a way to try and account for detectability biases. It is much easier to see a big bumblebee queen uh, than a tiny metallic sweat bee when, uh, when they go zooming by your head. Uh, so that bee hanging onto my sleeve right there, uh, she was not fair game, because not on a flower. If she had hopped down to a thistle or something, then I, then I could have snatched her up. Um, so these walks varied in time from 30 minutes to two hours, uh, depending on the size of the site. And this information will serve to round out our species list beyond bull data, because again, um, not, all, not all species are attracted to bulls, which is an unfortunate limitation of bull trapping. Uh, now, to kind of get into some tables and graphs, uh, first we're gonna look at our richness findings. Uh, now, not all of our specimens have been identified, so I unfortunately can't speak super in depth on species richness. Um, however, I have identified 22 bee genera from our meandering walk data. Um, and here you can see that most genera are found in both burned and grazed prairies, uh, though a number were seen in only one management type. Now, I do think it's always worth it to look at some photos of these bees uh, we're talking about. Uh, everybody's familiar with honeybees and bumblebees, but they're really only a fraction of the variety we see here in Minnesota. So on the top left, we have uh, the bright green agapostamin. It's actually a pretty large-sized sweat bee. Um, and below that on the left is the long antennae melisodes, super common in our bowls. Um, particularly tough to tell the species apart. I'm, I'm learning that now. Uh, the top right is the yellow masked hyleus, um, and that's a tiny hairless bee, often uh, easy to mistake for a wasp, but uh, definitely an interesting bee. And below that is the, the, the bee nomia, and it, it, the picture doesn't do it justice, um, but it has these like, amazing opalescent bands along its abdomen. Um, so they're really fun to, fun to learn and fun to look at under the scope, and you can't, you can't beat those photos by Sam Drogi. Our sites varied in the number of genera seen. So uh, the y-axis on this uh, slide indicates the number of genera seen at a site with each bar representing a different prairie. Um, so the black uh, indicates burn sites and the green indicates gray sites. Um, our site with the greatest generic richness uh, located on the far left of the graph was a private gray site with um, 10 genera collected there. Um, that site is interesting. It borders Glacial Lake State Park, so that may have something to do with kind of the, uh, the richness we're seeing there. Uh, it is a beautiful site in and of itself, though, um, and that's one of our dry prairie sites. At this point, I would say there are some light trends in generic diversity. Um, it's worth noting that six out of our seven most generically rich sites are burned, um, but with such small numbers of genera here, you know, we're looking at really a scale of, of 10 on the high end to five at the low end. I don't know if there's much indication of difference at this time, but once we get that species-specific richness. You know, these trends might kind of blow out a little bit more. Uh, looking at the genera here, so each bar now represents a genus of bee. Um, so this time, uh, yeah, genus is along the x-axis and the number of sites at which enus, each, each genus was observed along the y-axis. Um, so the genus Bombus, which is bumblebees, was the most widely distributed, being seen at 19 out of our 20 sites. Uh, 
uh, apis, which is honeybees, and melosodes, which is, again, that long antennae bee that I uh, showed on a couple slides back, uh, are a close second. And I do think it's also worth noting that a number of genera were only seen at one or two sites. So today, this is some new information that I can share with you all. I'll be diving into the bumblebees a little bit more closely. Um, I have identified the bumblebees collected during our meandering walk to species. Um, during the two summers, we collected 11 species of bumblebees pictured here. Uh, oh, and I, I should note that we did not see Bombus affinis, the, the recently federally listed as endangered bumblebee species during our two years. Uh, looking here, bumblebee uh, bee species are listed along the x-axis. The y-axis represents the species distribution. Um, and again, black indicates burn sites, green indicates grazed sites. Uh, Bombus griseoculus, uh, the brown-belted bumblebee, was the species with the widest distribution, present at 16 out of 20 of our sites. On the other end of the spectrum, Bombus ternarius, which is the tricolored bumblebee, and Bombus tericola, the yellow-banded bumblebee, were found at just a single site. Um, so bumblebees were slightly more widely distributed at burn sites, um, though for some of the rare bees, it, it may be hard to accurately judge whether or not they preferred burn sites or were just um, flat out rare and, and not seen kind of by chance. Bombus borealis, though, I think does seem to show a clear preference for burn sites to graze prairies, and it is one of the second most commonly seen species at burn sites. Um, so I think the fact that it wasn't seen at graze sites is, is indicative of something. Um, whereas Bombus oricomus and Bombus pennsylvanicus may seem to prefer uh, graze sites. Also worth noting that we did collect three species designated by the IUCN as vulnerable, um, which I choose to see as encouraging. Um, even though we didn't collect all that many of them, uh, it's good to know that we can still find these bees out on the prairie. Moving on to abundance. We collected over 12.3 thousand specimens over the course of two years. Burned and gray sites didn't differ all that much um, in terms of the numbers collected, uh, though they were a bit higher in grazed prairies. Year-to-year -year variation was striking, though, with well over twice as many bees collected in 2017 as in 2016. Um, for the next few slides, we'll be looking at some graphs. In all of them, the y-axis represents the number of bees collected during a site visit. Um, so that ranges from zero, which did happen once, found no bees in our 30 bowls, plenty of flies, I'm sure, but no bees, um, to just shy of 1,000, which happened once actually at that, um, that really nice private gray site near Glacial Lake State Park. Um, I lost my place, sorry. Okay, so as, as mentioned before, black represents burn sites and grease represents gray sites. Uh, looking at the box plot on the left, uh, you can see that gray sites did have higher abundances on average. Um, though this is not quite a significant difference, um, and this tracks, again, what we saw on the last slide. The scatter plot on the right, the x-axis represents date. We have it um, kind of by Julian day so that you can have 2016 and 2017 overlapping. We're looking at um, both of those years across the summer. And again, there's no real difference between um, the burned and grazed sites. Year does tell quite a different story. Um, so on this slide, the pinkish orange represents uh, surveys conducted in 2016, and the blue represents surveys from 2017. Um, looking at the box plot first, again, there's a, a clear difference with 2017 um, showing much higher numbers. Um, when we break things up by dates on the scatter plot, I think the story changes a bit. Uh, and as you can see from that cluster of blue points um, towards the left side of the plot, we started collecting earlier in 2017 by just about a month. Um, and during that time, we did see relatively high abundances. And that was to, we tried to get out earlier to capture some of the spring diversity that we didn't see in 2016. Um, and similarly, we finished a bit earlier in 2017 than in 2016, meaning we avoided some of those really low numbers you can see in the, the orangish cluster at the, at the far right end of the, um, of the plot. However, even when we account for that difference in sampling timing in our models, year does still explain a significant amount of variation. So there is some year-to-year -year variation we're picking up on top of um, that difference in sampling method. Uh, so this slide is looking at how prairie type influences abundance. Um, each of these three box plots compares sites that contained a given prairie type to those that did not. Um, so the first on the left compares sites containing dry prairie. The, uh, those are indicated in orange to those without. Um, so here there is a significant difference with those dry containing sites having greater abundances. Um, there's no real difference uh, between the second two uh, box plots with, um, yeah, no difference between music sites and those without music and uh, sites that contained wet prairie and those that did not. Um, now I will say anecdotally, even though I haven't uh, identified all of the, the species yet, um, there are some really interesting bees showing up in those dry sites. 
um, things I, I'm not really seeing anywhere else. Um, again, that, that same private site that I've mentioned a couple of times um, is really interesting, um, a, lot of, a lot of things there. Um, so something interesting is happening here, and the soil may have something to do with it. And to that end, I'm actually interested in thinking about prairie type in a bit of a different way. Uh, the way I presented it on the last slide with kind of three sets of binary analyses is a bit artificial. Um, just because a site contains a given prairie type doesn't mean it has particularly much of it at all, and that doesn't speak to the rest of the site. Uh, so for example, when we look at these sites, we see that they're pretty different. First, I would note the scale is much different. Um, the site on the right is, is a good deal smaller than the one on the left. Um, and again, that, that site, on the, uh, site on the right, a third of it is dry prairie, and the rest of it's mesic, whereas excuse me, the site on the left, only 5% is dry prairie, and most of the rest of it is wet. Um, so even though on our previous slide, those two are lumped together in analyses, um, it doesn't really speak to the full character of the site so much. Um, so therefore, I'm, I'm looking to quantify these differences between soil characters a bit more directly. Um, so uh, soil, uh, soil curves, cores uh, from each prairie type present in the site were collected during vegetation surveys, providing information on the proportion of clay, silt, and sand in addition to some other measures. Uh, so I calculated site-wide scores for the percentage of sand in soils, uh, which I have compared to bee abundance here. Um, so once again, uh, bees collected per visit makes up the y-axis, and the x-axis represents the calculated percent sand measure at a given site. The points in orange here represent those two sites with dry prairie from the previous slide. As you can see, when looking at this character, um, they may both have greater than a greater than average proportion of sand, maybe arguable for that kind of uh, one that comes up in the middle, um, but there definitely are sites that fall between them. Um, and so in this case, I would say there's an indication of a slightly positive relationship between the amount of sand in soils and the bees collected. Uh, it's not necessarily as striking as that kind of dry prairie box plot, um, but I believe it represents the way of things a little bit more realistically and accounts for the fact that um, yeah, it's not the dry, a site that contains dry prairies. It's not entirely dry prairie. There are plenty of other things going on at that site. Uh, so wrapping things up for the bees, uh, here's a summary of what they're currently telling us. Um, management, you know, our, our central motivating question, um, appears to really have no significant impact on bee abundance. Um, similarly, site size, these vegetation characters that, that I didn't really get into because, uh, you know, they, they were not coming up as significant and they're showing really anything particularly interesting. Um, show no relationship. Um, date is, of course, a very important predictor of bee abundance, but as I said before, even when accounting for this year is still significant. Um, finally, the average percent sand of a site um, is a moderately significant predictor, I would say, um, coming in at levels just above 0.05. And with that, we'll turn it back to Julia uh, to, for the butterflies. Great. So, um, moving into butterflies, as Patrick said. Um, all right. So these questions for the butterflies will look somewhat familiar, um, similar to vegetation and bee questions that we had. Um, so do butterfly species richness and abundance differ between sites managed with fire and grazing? Um, do they, I'm also interested in um, knowing if they differ for prairie associated species in particular, and whether or not there are species specific responses to management. Um, and then tied into all of these sort of levels of, of butterfly questions, I'm also uh, interested in whether or not the management is affecting butterflies directly or if there's um, an effect of the vegetation community that we're seeing on the butterflies sort of separate from that management or as, as, a, as an effective management on vegetation. So, all right. Um, butterfly surveys were conducted concurrently with bee surveys and took place Again, as, as Patrick mentioned, for the, D, for the bees, um, three times a year at each of our sites during both 2016 and 2017. Butterflies were surveyed also using two methods, and the first was a standardized pollard walk for relative abundance. Um, and during, during this walk, um, I set out a 400-meter transect and walked this at a steady pace of 10 meters a minute, um, recording everything seen in a five-meter square box sort of imaginary box to the front. And this is to account for differences in detectability between um, species that are more or less visible or um, fly at different heights above the vegetation. Uh, the second method was an opportunistic walk, again, similar to, to that opportunistic walk for the bees. Uh, 
and this was used to supplement the species list at each site. Butterflies were primarily captured, identified, and released in the field. However, I did collect voucher specimens that will be deposited at the University of Minnesota Insect Collection. Um, so these photos here just highlight some of the diversity seen in the three butterfly families that contain our Minnesota prairie specialists. The photo on the right contains uh, specimens of seven different species of skippers in the family Hesperiidae. The photo on the top left shows five species in the family Lycenidae, and the bottom two photos uh, show 13 species in the Nymphalidae family. And butterflies in the Pieridae and, and Papillionidae uh, families were also observed, but not, just not pictured here. In terms of analyses, um, butter, butterfly abundance and richness data were both analyzed using Poisson distributed generalized linear mixed models with site as a random effect. Um, and these models included a combination of management, site, and vegetation variables, such as management type, site area, forward frequency, and prairie type. I'm pointing them out here just uh, because you'll be seeing some of these variables show up later on. So just so you um, kind of have an idea of what was included when, um, when asking these questions. My hypothesis for uh, butterfly species richness is um, if one management type favors a greater number of butterfly species, then we expect that management type will emerge as a significant uh, predictor in the models. And however, if butterflies are responding predominantly to vegetation community, then we'd expect the vegetation variables will um, be significant in the models and management type may explain less of that richness. So there, for, for results, there actually were no difference in species richness between management types. 40 species were observed over both years, 30 of which were seen at both burned and grazed sites. Nine of the 40 observed species are prairie dependent or prairie associated species. And although on average there was no difference in the number of species at burn versus grace sites, the species composition did differ a bit between these management types. Um, so of the butterfly species that were management specific, five of these were seen only at grace sites here on the left, and five were seen only at burn sites on the right here with the black box. Prairie associated species are shown in the thick boxes with the, the green border and black borders here. And on the gray sites, the prairie ringlet and tawny edged skipper, and at the burn site, the arogo skipper. Um, I, I do want to point out here that uh, only two of these management specific species, the tawny edged and common checkered skipper, were seen um, in numbers greater than five. So these are actually quite rare or difficult to detect species and, again, may not, um, may not be exclusively at sites managed with grazing or burning. They may just be in very low numbers and difficult to find. For richness, year was not a significant predictor, um, although slightly more species were seen in 2016 than in 2017. In this graph, the number of species are represented on the y-axis and the sites are along the x-axis. Uh, species in 2016 species richness is shown in red and 2017 in blue. So to summarize overall species richness results, management type was not significant, and sites including wet prairie tended to have higher species richness. A year and the other site and vegetation variables did not explain significant variation in species richness. Moving on to some prairie associated uh, richness data. Prairie associated richness also did not differ between management type. Eight prairie associated species were seen at grazed sites shown here within the green box, and seven species were shown uh, were found at burned sites within the black box here. Um, really, there was no variation in prairie associated species explained by anything that I looked at. So here you can just see, a list, um, vegetation was not significant and uh, management was not, and these numbers are, are very similar. So um, that, that's, there's nothing happening of interest there right now. Moving into abundance, um, these questions are similar to the richness questions, but my hypotheses here were if management type directly favors a greater number of butterfly individuals, then we expect management type to emerge as a significant predictor. 
Um, again, however, if the butterflies are responding more to the vegetation community, uh, we'd expect those vegetation variables to emerge as significant predictors. So in this graph, the number of individuals are represented on the y-axis and butterfly species are on the x-axis. Individuals at burn sites are shown in black and individuals at graze sites in green, as with um, previous similar graphs. I've highlighted the prairie associated species here with the, green, or the blue stars so that you can um, see where they fall in the order. Um, so here, management type does explain a significant amount of variation in overall butterfly abundance. And Julian date, year, butterfly family, forb frequency, graminoid diversity, and the presence of dry prairie at a site explain the most variation in butterfly abundance. And you can see I've just highlighted those um, significant associations in the yellow boxes. So the, the presence of dry prairie was correlated with lower butterfly abundance, which is kind of interesting, and I think this may be related to what Patrick mentioned, where we really only have two sites that we're surveying for insects that have dry prairie. Um, so it could just be a, uh, an effect of, of that. The importance of Julian Day is also somewhat to be expected as different species are flying during different times of the season. And certain common and abundant species are likely to have a stronger influence on abundance during their flight period than um, less common species. For example, the painted lady, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Site area and the number of years a site was managed did not explain any significant difference in abundance. And these results indicate that there is a strong effect of vegetation on butterfly abundance, but that even when this is accounted for, there is additional variation explained by the management type. Uh, this next graph gives a little closer look at how abundance differed between years and is similar to the graph we looked at earlier for species richness. This time, however, the species on the y-axis are representing the number of individuals as opposed to um, number of species. Although the overall abundance numbers are very similar between years, there was variation uh, between years at, at a site level and at a species level. So there are some interesting things um, going on at the species level here between years that may be contributing to the significance of that year term in the abundance model. And these graphs are, um, again, have now species on the x-axis and individuals on the y-axis. The first difference of note was a surge in abundance of painted ladies um, from 2016 to 2017, which I'm sure many of you noticed. Um, their abundance increased by an order of magnitude between years, and the y-axis and the two graphs are actually on different scales. Um, so the y-axis on 2017 had to be bumped up um, solely because of painted lady abundance that year. Uh, Regal fritillaries, however, the prairie specialist um, of, of concern here in Minnesota, showed almost no change in abundance between years. And several other prairie specialists of particular interest were observed only during one year of the study and in very low abundances. Because the goal of this study is to understand how prairie management is impacting butterflies that rely on it as habitat, we are primarily interested in um, the, the later two examples. So an unusually large continental migration of painted ladies um, is more likely to confuse some of those trends in the data than illuminate anything about the effects of prairie management as the painted ladies are habitat generalists that feed on a wide variety of plants, um, both as larvae and adults. So because of this, I've chosen to remove a number of common highly mobile or migratory habitat generalists from the data and focus more on those species that are uh, most likely to be impacted by management changes in the prairie. So here, looking just at that subset of butterflies, there was actually no effect of management on butterfly abundance once, once those were removed. So Julian Day and Year, butterfly family and Forb frequency were still highly significant, and higher graminoid diversity was correlated with higher butterfly abundance. Um, dry prairie also was indicative of, of lower abundance as before. And this time we do see a relationship between mesic and wet prairie as well. And those were positive correlations with butterfly, or with, um, uh, with butterfly abundance. Site area 
um, site area and the number of years managed were, again, not significant here. Um, looking just at the abundance data for the nine prairie specialists that we observed in this study, some strong signals emerged that were not seen when grouping all species together. Although more individuals were seen at burned sites, um, as you can see primarily from the common wood nymph and the regal fritillary here on the left side of the graph, um, when all the other vegetation and the, all the other variation in the model was accounted for, gray sites actually emerged as significantly correlated with higher prairie-associated butterfly abundance. So that's kind of an interesting, um, an interesting thing to note here. The number of years managed was also a significant predictor for the first time where um, sites managed less frequently had a, showed a higher abundance of prairie-associated species. Larger sites also had um, significantly higher abundance of prairie-associated species, as did sites where wet or music prairie were present. Julian Day and Year were again significant predictors of abundance, as were Forb and Graminoid frequency and also butterfly family. Higher forb and graminoid frequency were strongly predictive of higher prairie-associated butterfly abundance. Because different butterfly species rely on different plants for their larval food, the importance of particular host plant associations could be lost when grouping butterfly species together, even at the prairie-associated um, level. So I'm expecting that if management type affects individual species abundance differently, that this will be in part due to variation in host plant frequency um, at those sites. So I'm going to pull out three species as examples just to look at briefly here. Um, the monarch, the regal fritillary, and the long dash skipper. Um, the monarch butterfly, Danaeus plexippus, feeds exclusively on milkweeds as larvae, which I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, and while it's not a prairie specialist, um, much of its remaining suitable habitat in Minnesota can be found in prairies while it's here over, um, over the summer breeding period. So management type for monarchs did explain significant variation in monarch abundance, with burn sites having higher abundance. Four frequency and diversity were also highly significant. Um, interestingly, though, while four frequency was uh, correlated with higher monarch abundance, Forb diversity was correlated with lower monarch abundance, and the frequency of milkweed did not explain any addition variation, um, additional variation in the model. For the regal fritillary, um, again, a prairie specialist that, that we're all pretty interested in, in keeping an eye on here in Minnesota, um, it feeds only on violets as a, as a larvae, particularly on the bird's foot violet here in the Minnesota prairie. I mean, it, it overwinters as an unfed larvae. Management type did explain most of the variation in, um, in regal fritillary abundance. And the model, including host plant frequency and site size, also explained slightly more of the variation. So higher host frequency of violets and larger sites correlated with higher regal fritillary abundance. It's also worth noting that although there were more individuals at burn sites, um, as you can see on the graph here, um, regals were actually observed at twice as many grazed sites as burnt sites, um, simply in lower numbers. Uh, the long dash, our final example here, is a prairie specialist that feeds on grasses in its larval stage, and it overwinters as a larva in a shelter it builds at the base of grasses. And we, we know much less about the life history of the long dash than we do about many other species. Oops, I think I didn't go forward. Sorry there, here's some pictures. Um, and this just shows um, an example of a few grasses that it, it likely feeds on, but we actually, we're not quite sure how many grasses it, it feeds on as a, as a larvae. So some of these uncertainties in prairie skippers in general are being um, looked at through the efforts of Robert Dana at the DNR and the Prairie Butterfly Conservation Program at the Minnesota Zoo, um, among others. But due to that uncertainty right now about which grasses the long dash prefers as host plants, I have modeled abundance, including graminoid frequency and abundance, in place of specific host plant metrics um, at this time. So for the long dash, um, abundance was highly correlated with grazed sites. Site area was also a significant predictor. Um, here you can see that. And um, this may be... So what we see here with um, 
yeah, so it's like, actually I, I wrote this, let's see. Um, yeah, so gr graminoid frequency was not, uh, not predictive. And this, it could be that this, the generalization of putting all these grasses together is not explaining, um, explaining an actual host plant correlation. So I think that, that this one probably would need to be elaborated on when we, when we know, have a better idea of what they're eating as larvae. Um, so here also with the regal fritillary abundance, I want to point out that even though the graze sites were strongly correlated with long dash abundance, two-thirds, I'll just go here, two-thirds of the sites, um, it was only seen at six sites, and four of those were actually burned sites, so that's worth um, taking into consideration, I guess. A few take-home messages for the butterflies. Uh, burned sites had a higher overall abundance of butterflies, but species richness did not differ between management types. Um, higher forb frequency and graminoid frequency and diversity correlate with higher butterfly abundance, but not richness. Um, large graze sites were correlated with higher abundance of prairie-associated species. And species-specific tests indicate that management type is a significant predictor of abundance, although different species may respond favorably to different management types. So um, that's it for today. We will be holding a field day this summer immediately following the DNR Native Plant ID workshop on June 27th and 28th. Um, we'll be, the Plant ID workshop ends on the 27th, so we'll be kind of tagging on to the end of that. We hope you will join us at Overby WPA in Pope County for hands-on demonstrations of our plant and pollinator survey methods, as well as species identification and more detailed information about the life history traits of the bees and butterflies um, relevant for prairie conservation and management. In addition to our team, we will have some other researchers from the University of Minnesota joining us to share their own prairie pollinator research. And this, um, this photo of Overby is uh, uh, just to entice you to come out there and join us. It's really quite a lovely site. So thank you all for listening today, and a uh, big thank you to the LCCMR for funding this research and to our collaborators, botanists, field and lab technicians, and all the land managers and private landowners who have made the research possible. Um, it's truly been a collaborative effort. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Julia, Diane, and Patrick. That was very um, interesting. So I'm Amanda McCulpin, and I'm standing in as host for Paul Charland. So I'm sure there are questions out there. If anyone has questions, you can um, unmute yourself by pressing star six, or you can type it into the chat box and I'll relay it. Great, and I was actually gonna mention for questions, maybe if, if you think you know it's particularly like a vegetation related question or a bee or butterfly question, um, that would make it a little easier for us on our, on our end to make sure the right person is on the line for that. Well, this is um, Amanda again. So I, I do have a, a general question about um, the setup, the um, the grazing intensity. Do you have any insights about about that or how different that was among sites? Um, sure. Yeah, it was a question about grazing intensity. I'm just letting Diane and Patrick know. Um, yeah. So we do um, we do have records of stocking rate. Um, so we do have that data. Um, at this point, I, um, I don't have any analyses um, looking at that, but we do have accounted, we do have that accounted for, and we also do have um, some more uh, records of, yeah, which years grazing happened during and how many years. So some of that was taken into account in these analyses today. And we also have some information for that for fire and burn times, um, burn years, et cetera. Thank you. And um, I have a couple of uh, questions came in over the chat. So one question is, did you explore interactions between grazing and birding? For example, establishment or reproduction of plant species? Uh, so just to repeat the question everyone here is about um, looking at interaction terms um, with management and vegetation in particular. Um, Diane, do you have anything to say to that? 
Hi, this is Diane. Um, so my understanding is you want to know about the interactions between what now for vegetation? Grazing, grazing and burning. Oh, okay. So, the, so we, because this was such a complicated question, if you did the interaction, our sites were actually either either burned or grazed. We didn't have any that combined the two, although we know that's a valid management technique and it just was beyond the scope of this project. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that. So um, another question from Marissa Ehrling is, for the bee and butterfly work, have you thought about considering landscape metrics, like distance to other native prairie? Okay, hang on a second. Uh, so uh, um, we have not quite looked at surrounding landscape at the time being. Um, so Jen Larson, who we, we kind of plugged earlier as, as kind of our uh, an amazing person working on our project, has been looking at um, surrounding landscape um, and, you know, quantifying that. Um, I can say kind of anecdotally it does definitely vary. Um, I know when I was talking about bees, I kept talking up this one site that, that did border Glacial Lake State Park, um, but a lot of our other sites were surrounded by agriculture. Um, so that's that's something that we are planning to look at, but we don't have anything for it at this moment. And there's another question about um, was the timing and intensity of management generally the same across all sites? So I can speak um, to the, I know for uh, the grazed sites in particular, uh, it was not. Um, so a number of our grazed sites were privately grazed, privately owned, um, and so those, you know, those folks are managing uh, for beef cattle. <laughs> um, so they're kind of grazing every year, um, just trying to kind of get the most out of their land and, and definitely keep it, keep it productive and keep it um, healthy. Um, but that's different than uh, actually, so Overby, the site that, that we're going to be going to in the summer, um, that is grazed kind of in collaboration with, um, with the government. So that's uh, meant to be promoting, you know, certain prairie health. Um, so the, the intensity definitely differed um, between sites. And I, I, I don't have uh, on the top of my head right now if, uh, how much burning um, differed, um, but I do know uh, that grazing varied quite differently. Thank you. Yeah. And there's a question. This is a vegetation question. All right. Then I'll, I'll pass it over to Diane. Sure. Hi. What's the question? The question is, what was the baseline vegetation at these sites before management started and after management began, um, or 2016 compared to 2017? Okay, the, that's a difficult question. The, <clears throat> the baseline is that these are all remnant prairies, so we assume that sometime in the past, then that past date is undetermined, these were all relatively similar within their wet music or dry categories. So, but because, because we, for vegetation, we visited the sites only once, we don't really have a comparison to make between 2016 and 2017, so we can't really say that things were changing in one way or another. And to be honest, two years wouldn't, wouldn't really give us much information anyway um, about directionality of change. Um, so I, I'm, again, I, I can't, there's limitations to the data and the scope of the study and that unfortunately is another one that um, I come up short on. But I, the, all I can say is they really are all remnant prairies. So that's, that's the best indication that they were similar at one time. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a question um, specifically, is there a time of year that either management should occur to benefit the three questions here? Um, and I assume the three questions being uh, vegetation, bees, and butterflies. Yeah, okay. The, um... So I guess the timing of the grazing or burning is mm -hmm. kind of what I'm seeing. Yeah, and I know that more from the literature than from this study, um, although it's a great question and we do have some information about 
timing of grazing. Less, most of the fires are done pretty much at the same time of year. I don't think we have a great deal of variation in the timing within a year of the fires. The main thing for the bees and the butterflies with the fires is that you don't burn everything all at once. <laughs> that, that's pretty clear um, from lots of work. As far as the grazing, um, do you, maybe Julia can answer this because I don't know exactly. Yeah, um, um, I know. So we we for the insect sites at least we had half of our sites were grazed, and we did have some private land managers, which I think, as Patrick mentioned, they tended to have their cattle out every year, but they were on a rotation. So um, they seemed they would be out at different times of the year in one section of the land, and then they would usually be moved uh, throughout the year. It seemed like probably, um, this is kind of anecdotally, I don't have the, the information in front of me now, but, but um, maybe like every month or every three to four weeks, something somewhere in there, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and, and for the, um, the DNR and, and Fish and Wildlife land, I'm pretty sure that those would were grazed. I think some of them, again, maybe only every two to five, six years. But even during a single year when they were out there, they would be out there for maybe a period of, um, of Six weeks, in, and that would vary in timing um, depending on the year. It seemed it seemed like, but I actually probably some some of the land managers are, are maybe listening here today and, and they know more about that than than I do. And there's thank you. Um, there's a kind of a related question to this topic. Um, what were the objectives of the grazing and burning? And you've uh, the, the three of you have alluded to this that on private ground. Um, in, at least for the grazing, they're actually raising cattle. But maybe um, maybe you have some more insights about the objectives, the management objectives. Um, sure. Yeah, you mean from the perspective of the cattle managers themselves, I guess. Right. So the sites that were grazed, you know, what were the objectives for the grazing and the sites that were burned? Um, yeah, um, I guess I would I would say um, that when so when we approached our our collaborators, so both the private landowners and um, the Wetland Morris Management Management District, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, etc. Um, I think we um, our objective was to look at conservation grazing, so so sites that really are grazed with the objective of um, keeping the prairie habitat intact. And um, so, so there is, I guess, even for the private landowners that were production grazing, um, from a, on an individual basis, I think that they also all had a strong um, desire to graze their land in a way that was, um, uh, was to, to keep that prairie habitat as, um, for, I guess, from like a, conservation grazing perspective. But I, I don't know if I can really, I don't know, illuminate that too much more. Um, I'm going to share the question for a minute with, with um, Patrick and Diane here, too. But the, the question was about conservation, or no, grazing, and what was the objective of keeping grazing? So I don't know. If... Yeah, I think, I think that's probably about all we can say on that. Um, All right, thank you. Um, so again, anybody, if, if you can unmute yourself uh, by pressing star six if you want to ask a question directly or type into the chat box and um, we can stick around for a few more minutes if there are more questions. Hey, this is Sarah Morris. I was wondering if you could talk, maybe this might be a question for Diane because it's kind of a bigger study design sure. question. You let me put her on right now because we're actually all on one phone here. So um, it's, it's Sarah. Hello. Hi, Diane, Sarah. Um, so I was curious if you could talk a little bit about how you uh, defined a burn site and a graze site. And I know it was really challenging to find places that have only one or the other, and so there were some, you know, limitations on what you could do as far as the study design went. But like I was thinking of a couple of those units. I know, you know, personally, were classified as burn sites, but they've only been burned once in the last. 20 years, so really that's maybe more of a rest site 
Yeah, I think that was that was definitely a problem we had, and we try, our our criteria was that it had that the site had 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 the management type either burned or grazed at least once in the last ten years. So, so that's what we asked for when we were approaching managers. Um, and then, of course, we hope for more frequent management than that. And with grazing, we usually got it. But with with burning, I think we have a range of of times. Some had been more burned more often, and I don't have the data in front of me. But but you're right. Some of those were, um, yeah, like poor Dibdal. Um, <laughs> perhaps maybe he hadn't been burned enough. But um, that's something that we want to take into account in our our analyses, and I think um, Patrick and Julia have done that more than I have so far with the vegetation. That was going to be my follow-up question. It looked like they had something related to yep. like frequency, or I can't remember what they called it, but that, okay. Right. Yep, how many times, and, and we, we can say how many times it's had management and what was the most frequent. So you have a yearly record of the, the management that right. occurred. So. Right. Okay. We just don't always know what time the burn was with certainty. Right. Well, this is GB, Diane. Uh, it, you know, when the management did occur, it definitely could affect things. I mean, uh, if we had happened to burn one of those units that year, it might have been, um, I don't know, uh, in recovery of that vegetation-wise. So. Yeah, I think we did not have – I. If Jen were here, she could say for sure, but I think we did not have any that were actually burned in the year that we sampled. Is that, is that right? Yeah, because for insects, we really didn't want that to happen. Um, so the, the most recent would have been 2015. At least that was our goal. It may, and that's certainly true for the insect sites. I would, I would say it's probably true for the vegetation sites. The, the outside of the insect sites. Anything else? There is one question that came across. Uh, were cattle treated with insecticides? Do you know? Do you know if cattle were treated with insecticides? We don't know. That's uh, a good question. It didn't even occur to me until this minute. So. Yeah, uh, this is JB. I can probably um, allude to that. I guess uh, in doing an informal survey of uh, producers I work with, um, nearly every one of them do some sort of uh, treatment, usually a, a winter pour on of ivermectin. Um, so, uh, you know, usually in order of several months prior to them going on grass, but some some will do it right before they do go on grass. So, uh, hmm. that might be a good tidbit of information to find out, especially from the, the uh, commercial pastures. Yep. We'll make a note of that. Thank you. Do you know, JB, like how likely it is that that ivermectin would get off onto the vegetation, or would, you know, would would the animal have to contact the insect directly? Uh, it's pretty much just comes out in the the, the deposits on uh, out of the rear end. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, nice. the cow pies. Right. Most of what they use are systemic, so it's like what you put on your dog for flea and tick control. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, I want to thank the presenters very much. I want to thank you know, Sarah and JP and anybody who else was involved in the study and thank all of you for attending the webinar. Yeah, thanks a lot. And this will be posted at some point um, on PRI as well as other places so that you'll have access to it um, in the future and your colleagues who couldn't attend.